Hello, um, thank you for joining us today for our presentation on building the unicorn or how to balance magic and practicality in research information systems. My name is Cynthia Hudson Vitali. I'm the director of scholars and scholarship with the Association of Research Libraries. And joining me today is Dan Coughlin, head of strategic technologies and interim head of research informatics and publishing at Penn State University Libraries. And today, I'm just going to quickly cover uh, some of the challenges of discovering and accessing research information for institutions. Um, Dan is going to talk through a Penn State case study and ways in which they have found um, beneficial for addressing some of these challenges. And then we're going to just wrap up quickly with some best practices for stakeholders to adopt and improve the discoverability and relationship between assets. So um, <laughs> research information systems are not new to libraries or institutions of higher education. As far back as 2003 in the United States and even prior to that in Europe and the rest of the world, um, institutions were exploring ways to aggregate information about research conducted on their campuses from large commercial databases or using online tools. OCLC has been leading the exploration of CRIS implementation across academic institutions and has have a number of amazing reports out. And additional work has been conducted by ACRL. And then of course, there is a lot of independent researchers who share their experiences and work about research information systems. But the implementation and adoption of these tools have obviously not been without their challenges. Specifically, institutions have been challenged with an increased workload for staff who have to implement them or clean up some of the metadata prior to it being uploaded into the research information system, the need to develop new skills to implement these platforms, uh, the ongoing engagement with stakeholders to ensure information is up to date. Uh, some of the difficulties in ingesting information into the system, and I think this kind of speaks to uh, continuing um, challenges with metadata interoperability and quality. And finally, difficulties in creating a comprehensive research information management environment. Um, as we know, there are many um, options out there to aggregate information about research conducted on your campuses. But what is comprehensive is a challenge to assess. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Dan to talk a little bit more about how he's addressing these issues at Penn State. Well, thank you, Cynthia, for the introduction. Um, I'm Dan Coughlin, I'm the IT department head at Penn State Libraries. And I'm gonna discuss the technology that we developed at Penn State that we referred to as the unicorn, but we do have a bit of a more formal name at this point. Um, and that's the Researcher Metadata Database, um, or RMD. Years ago, I worked on a project to develop tools to analyze journal usage. And without going too much into the details on the depths of difficulty that existed, this was back in 2013 or so, um, to do broad level analysis on journal usage at our libraries, I'll say that one of the salient lessons from that exercise was learning that the effort to organize data, clean the data, provide the data, in the most basic of statistics was rather large. So doing any real data analysis on that project ended up to be very difficult due to time constraints. And most of these processes were so specific for that project and they just could not be repeated. They were on spreadsheets somewhere and we couldn't really query them for anything other than the information uh, that we provided. So when we initially started this project, which was about discovering research outputs that were performed on our campus, you know, what articles did Penn State publish this year or last year, which authors published which papers and which journals. There's a bit of a parallel to that, you know, earlier project um, and that we're trying to measure journal usage, but largely at a different phase of the research life cycle. So that earlier project is the life cycle of research where usage is likely made up of literature reviews and reading articles and downloads um, to help you with your research. Um, in this case, we're more at the end of the research life cycle. So the real similarity, though, um, is in the challenges this problem presented. So competing data sources, complex propriety data structures, silos of information. Um, our research outputs exist in several systems, but they, number one, they exist in the journals they're published in, and there are thousands of those. 
we didn't want to query every single journal out there. Um, we had systems that were already doing pieces of this. So we wanted to leverage that. And the reason I talk about that complexity of the data sources and comparing it to the project on measuring journal usage is that I had one year of journal usage data that I had worked with from 2012 back on that project. And people thought it would be great if they could use this tool I had. Um, however, I was not able to like leverage it for any additional data or annual data imports or able to make it something that could be maintained or updated to kind of keep the lights on, so to speak. Um, so our first goal for, you know, for our unicorn, for our researcher metadata database was to be better than that, right? We wanted this application to be able to repeat its process of importing data on an annual basis. We wanted to be able to work on data analysis more than data aggregation. And frequently when we talk about RMD, this is something that we overlook, but I do think it's a critical aspect of it. So perhaps I place a bit more importance on this because I was bitten by not doing it previously. Um, but some of the other goals, right, uh, were <clears throat> we wanted to aggregate data from enough sources that we felt confident to use it for being the data backbone of our open access workflow. We wanted to provide access to the data that we had via an API. So this could help units on campus with faculty profiles or institute and department websites. Um, and then three, we wanted to generate administrative reports for common questions that were asked either by other departments or administrators. And then, as I mentioned, we wanted to be able to repeat the process of aggregating that data so we could do this every year. So I'm going to talk a little bit about each of these goals um, and what we did for these use cases. One of the initial questions people would bring up about powering our open access workflow is, how are you going to get the research that you don't know about? Well, we aren't. And I don't, I'm not trying to sound glib about that, but we felt that a significant amount of the research we were interested in for open access existed in other systems. And if we could, at least initially, focus on that content, then we were at a good starting point. So what were some of those data sources? Digital Measures um, has many names at Penn State. It's a vended software package that we use for faculty activity reporting. Our faculty input data, we automate that when possible but they input data and in digital measures is able to create a university dossier. Digital measure, sorry, digital measures has data in it. It's part of our faculty's process, albeit reluctantly, um, but it's a good source of data to measure research outputs. So RMD queries digital measures every night for updates and receives these following pieces of information. Um, an important piece to this for a school like arts and architecture at Penn State is having performances in there. Uh, we wanted to make sure we captured all research outputs, not only perhaps the more traditional journal articles. Uh, using digital measures enabled us to do that. Pure, which is another vended product, this one from Elsevier, that is our expert database on campus. And Pure allows you to search for a specific researcher in their interface. And this is an excellent source of data for publications. We query this nightly for research outputs to add to RMD as well. Um, we have our electronic thesis and dissertation system, which is um, a product that we've developed. Um, and all of our graduate students use this to submit their master's thesis or their PhD dissertation. So this is a data source that we queried so that we could display the faculty committees on profile pages. If a graduate student's looking at a faculty profile page, they can see the work that their graduate students have done. And they, be, they may be able to get a sense of what work they would be doing if that faculty member was their advisor. The news.psu.edu, um, where Penn State publishes stories on their faculty to promote their work. Um, we query this system to get any stories on our faculty so that we can link out to those stories in their profile page. Um, and Web of Science is where we pull additional publication information. Um, and those publications include grant numbers, this was really interesting to us because at some point we really want to be able to see, link a grant to a person to a publication, right? This grant was rewarded to this faculty member and ultimately produced this publication. And Web of Science did a good job of including metadata on the grant number that it was derived from and help us with part of this, right? So we could link the grant to a publication. The difficult part of it was then um, <coughs> linking the data, the correct author to the data to the current research, Penn State researcher, right? Um, which is a good segue to NSF. So we actually have grant data in other systems. 
um, but some of that grant information is not public and considered sensitive. So instead of worrying about authorization decisions on grants, we decided to query NSF um, and get Penn State information from a public source, which ensured our data was publicly available because of the way this information was organized. It made it easier to associate a grant with a Penn State researcher. So between these last two data sources, Web of Science and NSF, in some cases, we are able to link an NSF grant to a Penn State researcher and link that researcher to a publication that was found in Web of Science. So we have a little more than a couple thousand grants that are linked to one or more publications. <clears throat> Next is um, ORCID. So this was the first data source that we were, we were able to successfully write information to. Um, initially, as a test, we wrote employment. Um, or employer to, to ORCID, and then we worked with publications to ORCID from RMD. So as a researcher, you can log into RMD. This would be the screen that you would see when you log in. You view your publications, and if any of your publications have not been um, written to ORCID yet, right, you can kind of click that little button um, that says add to my ORCID record. And once it's been added, you would then see uh, an text indicating that the information has been written to work. Scholarsphere, which is our institutional repository, is our second data source that we're writing to. Um, I'll go into the workflow a bit of our open access implementation later, um, but from that listing of publications, you can click on the publication, right? So the previous screen that I was showing from RMD, you could click on the publication and then upload a file from RMD um, and in the background, it'll hand that PDF or the document to Scholarsphere and email you when it's complete to let you know that you've successfully uploaded the document from RMD to Scholarsphere. Um, and then Scholarsphere will return an open access URL for RMD to store so it knows about this. <clears throat> Next, if you're wondering, how do we know if a publication is or is not openly accessible? We query open access button by sending a DOI and then we retrieve an open access URL and a status, which is green, bronze, hybrid, gold, closed. Um, and we store that information for the publication as well. So some of these data sources we update automatically every night, like Digital Measures, Pure, the Penn State News. Others are a bit more involved and they require us to get a feed from our electronic thesis and dissertation system, for example, that we update semi-annually. Uh, we've considered adding additional data sources. For example, we have NSF, but we don't have NIH. Um, that's one that comes to mind. But for now, this is our data sources we're drawing from, and in some cases, providing data to. We do provide some of this information that we've aggregated in an HTTP RESTful-ish API. Um, so these aren't the only data sources we're providing to, but the API is a bit different in that we're providing that information to those units on campus that ask for it. So this is a screenshot of our documentation on the API. So from here, people are able to test out the API without doing any programming to see if the data each of these API endpoints will provide is, is usable to them. Um, that said, you can see we largely query by user, uh, but we do provide queries by publication and not seen here um, is query by organization. The only reason it's not seen here is I just couldn't fit it on the screen. Um, our API is organized by the use cases and requests that we've gotten. So the largest of those use cases is for department and directory web pages. So that's what a lot of our API is geared towards. Um, I think a fair question would be, you know, Digital Measures has an API, Pure has an API. Why don't you just provide those APIs to campus units? Um, we do provide that. Uh, but at the time we were developing RMD, it became clear that a number of units on campus wanted this information to promote their faculty on the college directory, department, or institute website, and they really liked the information was continually being updated. So they wouldn't have to track down faculty to make updates themselves. So by creating this API as an entry point for our campus, it one, prevented a fracturing of users where some units are getting data from digital measures, some from pure and confusing people on which is you know the right one, so to speak. Oh, go to digital measures for the schools of arts and architecture. If you know a faculty member's research interests, go to Pure if you want a richer set of publication outputs on these faculty. We just didn't want that kind of confusion. Um, two, we thought the data from these sources isn't always exact. 
as we go through the data and digital measures, we do have people that are manually deduplicating um, and improving the quality of the data. And this action centralizes that task. And the other one is if Elsevier or Watermark upgrades the API, every unit on campus does not have to go through that process. So in some cases, I believe the Pure API is upgraded to be non-backwards compatible um, annually. So imagine several units not being able to do anything other than work on that upgrade at a certain point in the year. Um, this, you know, having this our API centralized centralizes the task of API maintenance and upgrades as well. So did we, we did not want to become, you know, a central profile site for our resource researchers. We wanted to provide access to this data so that the different units could create their own profile sites. The concern with creating the profiling site is that we would kind of balloon into a number of interested parties and become sort of an all time consuming part of our portfolio. So we're libraries, let's provide them with the information they need and they can create their own sites. In order to do that, we created a demo of what a profile would look like using the API from RMD. And so you can see, we can provide citations on publications from Digital Measures or Pure. Um, we can provide that graduate advising from our ETD system and then link into the ETD system for these theses. <clears throat> we can provide links to stories in the Penn State News. We can provide links to the grant information that they have been a part of. And going back to the publications, we can also provide links that are not behind a paywall to any of the content that's openly accessible. So not only do we have the citation, we have a link to the content. Um, and additionally, because we're using our faculty reporting system, the digital measures, right, we can provide a listing of performances for faculty that are in fields which are sort of less interested in the publications. So this is our profile demo website. I'll show some examples of units on campus that are using it. So here's the Huck Institutes using content that we've provided to drive their profiles. Um, and here's the College of Agricultural Sciences also using our API for their directory profiles um, and the listing of the publications for their food science department. So I'm gonna quickly discuss our use case of generating administrative reports. Basically, basically what we were looking to do is for those units that don't have IT support and they want data from this system so they can promote their faculty. So how can we provide access to this data in aggregate? And so we have an administrative site to the researcher metadata database <clears throat> and here is a screenshot where you can see all the publications we've aggregated from those various uh, sources. And you can see we have a listing of all those publications, over 330,000, and you could click through to see which of these are open access or exist in scholar sphere, um, et cetera. So the ability to provide this data to others is in this button right here where you could export the publications in a number of formats and share it with others. So you could right click that export and export those and provide the College of Engineering with a listing of their publications by year, right, if you wanted to. Um, so some content, which could be also be done from the API and a bit of programming logic, this is just another way for us to provide access to that data. So um, showing a screenshot for open access is a nice segue there um, to our, our last use case, and that's powering our open access workflow. In 2020, Penn State passed an open access policy stating that faculty need to provide an open access copy of their scholarship that has been done basically in 2020 and beyond. Um, so how can we enforce this policy? Um, and enforce is a bit of a loose word in my experience in academics. It's more like, how can we ask faculty nicely to do something they're required to do by a policy and limit the interruption in letting them know about the policy and limit the interruption in getting them to comply? Um, so step one with um, RMD, we have a good sense of what research outputs we know about from digital measures and pure. Um, we need to deduplicate the publications from these data sources, and we're able to do a significant amount of deduplication algorithmically. But when you have 330,000 publications and an algorithm that's at a 90 plus uh, percent success rate, that means you still have about 30,000 publications that need to be manually deduplicated. So we have a tool in RMD <clears throat> that allows our staff to do this. Excuse me, I need a drink. 
But then we query open access button with the publications we're able to find out which of these publications are openly accessible. And every four months or so, we email our researchers asking them for either URL or the content for any publications that we are not able to find an open access copy of. <clears throat> the researcher logs into RMD and provides either an open access URL or uploads a copy of that article to ScholarSphere or submits a waiver of the policy. And you saw that screenshot earlier um, when I was going through the data sources and showing how it writes to ScholarSphere as well. Um, so as we created this application, we are able to repeatedly get new metadata from these various sources. In some cases, we get it nightly. Some cases, we ask for an export or an import the data. Um, we can provide access to the data via an API for a number of reasons. The most popular is unit and directory pages or department directory pages. We can build and provide administrative reports. We can power our workflow to comply with the open access policy. Overall, it's been a critical aspect. Researcher metadata database has been a critical aspect of our open access workflow. We've been able to help other units on campus as well by providing access to this content. When we began our open access policy, one of the goals was to have 25% of our publications available via open access. Um, currently, we're at over 33% of our publications, and that number is actually much higher, nearly 50%, if you look at snapshots of, of more recent years. So um, one of the most difficult things is dealing with the, the ambiguity. Uh, is this researcher who we think it is? Is this document the same as another document that we're looking at, or publication the same as another publication document we're looking at? So working on this project provided real insight um, into the power of those identifiers like DOIs and ORCIDs. And um, I'll turn it back over to Cynthia to discuss um, some of those identifiers in more detail. Thank you. Thank you, Danny. Um, and just to kind of build off what Danny was saying there at the end, um, I think one of the um, most easy things we can do within um, higher education and within the scholarly and scientific communications ecosystem is broadly adopt percent of persistent identifiers. Um, and when we talk about the landscape of PIDs these days, uh, I, I think we're really talking about a couple of landscapes at once. Um, so on the, on the far left, um, one layer of that landscape is all about trying to figure out, you know, what do we want or need to identify? Um, there's DOIs for articles and data sets and preprints. There's ORC IDs for people. There's ROAR IDs for the research organizations, plus a whole wider uh, landscape of identifiers for grants and instruments and facilities and samples and conferences and projects. It's, there's a lot out there. Um, another layer of kind of the landscape for PIDs is the system tools, um, structures, infrastructures, and workflows that we need and standards for how we might use and organize them. Moving further over to the far right, it's all about how we connect these things, right? So they can, they can live as a jumble. We have the infrastructure. Now we need to move it over into a system of organization. Um, so we can connect these things together and get people on board with adoption. We can really achieve meaningful insights about research. When Danny was talking about excitedly, when he was talking excitedly about being able to join you know, the, the grant information with the faculty member at Penn State, and then with the article that came out of it, that's that's a that's a that's a very near possibility, um, but there are still some challenges we need to to overcome. Um, it's not just enough to have a PID, and it's not just enough to even have a set of PIDs or the infrastructure. They needed to be connected to one another, and they really need to be used. Um, obviously, outreach and adoption is a key part of this. Um, continuing to bring you know community together and raise awareness and also how can these um, kind of connections be set up seamlessly to really minimize friction and address some of those other human kind of challenges that we talked about earlier so um what does this all mean within uh in terms of how this landscape might be networked to unlock discovery. Um, the core of this is obviously the PIDs themselves. Um, but as we talked about, PIDs alone don't do much. Um, they need to be collected into workflows and systems and standards and infrastructure. Um, they need robust and open infrastructure to make it easy and sustainable. And then they need to be deposited into like global research infrastructure, such as Crossref and DataCite and ORCID. 
um, so that the metadata can be searched and the systems can connect. Uh, you know, all of this development is really aimed at activating the research landscape with PIDs. And just to, to kind of back up a moment, these best practices and kind of the, the information I'm sharing about persistent identifiers flows for some work that the Association of Research Libraries conducted in 2019, along with partners at the Association of American Universities, um, the Association of Public and Land Grant Universities, and the California Digital Library. And while it brought together folks to talk about um, the research data kind of landscape and the current state of persistent identifiers for data sets, these best practices that I'm going to share in a minute are really, are really global um, and I think are, are critical for meeting our needs within the research information management systems as well. So um, really it comes down to five things, I think we can, five easy things we can do to, to advance our work within research information systems. First, digital object identifiers to identify articles, preprints, research data, as well as publications and other outputs. Um, ORCIDs to identify researchers. ROARS, which is an institutional affiliation or research organization registry to um, identify and link organizational affiliation with an author or a co-author, um, Crossref funder registry IDs to identify research funders, and Crossref grant IDs to identify grants and other types of research awards. It's through the adoption of really these key PIDs that we're going to be able to see great advancements in connecting and finding and discovering research at our uh, uh, created on our institutions. So um, just to wrap things up, here are some references to some of those challenges I mentioned earlier. And uh, I just wanted to thank you on behalf of myself and Dan Coughlin. You're more than welcome to contact us if you have any questions. And uh, we thank you for your time today.